Welcome everyone to the Michigan Historic Preservation January 2020 January 2024 um, webinar. It's our first webinar for this year, and we are very excited that you are here joining us today. Um, our topic is the Phase One restoration of the 1876 Vermilion U.S. Life Saving Station building. And before we get started, um, I would like to go over some Zoom items. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box as you think of them. All the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So make sure you are typing the questions into the Q&A box instead of the chat box. The chat box will be used to share links or resources discussed during the presentation. Mm -hmm. And please participate in the survey after the webinar concludes. If it's your first time joining us, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We advocate for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We could not do the work we do without our members and volunteers. If you are not a member yet, please consider joining us at mhpn.org. Um, this webinar series is sponsored in part by an award from the Michigan Arts and Culture Council. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you our speakers today. We are going to hear from three speakers. Um, the first one, we are going to hear from Bruce Lin. So um, he is a Save Our Station Familia board member. He is also the secretary and executive director of the Great Lakes Shipwreck, Muse Shipwreck Historical Society in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And second, we will be hearing from Rick Newman, and he is the vice president and architect of Rick Mew Newman Architect in Petoskey, Michigan. And last but not least, we are going to hear from Ken Chapsky. He is an architect um, with Sanders and Chapsky Associates in Marquette, Michigan. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our speakers and bear with me for a second here. Okay, can you all see my PowerPoint here? Screen? Yes. yes. All right. Are we all set, Shohan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, my name is Ken Chapsky, and I'd like to welcome and thank everybody for attending this webinar. As Shohan has mentioned, uh, the title of our presentation today is the Phase I Restoration of the 1876 Station Building at the Vermilion Point U.S. Life Saving Station, which is located in Whitefish Township, Chippewa County, Michigan. Next slide, please, Sean. Our organization, SOS Vermilion, which is also called SOSV for short, is a nonprofit 501c3 organization dedicated to saving and preserving the 1876 station building at Vermilion. And we accomplished the first phase of restoration work in the summer of 2023, which involved constructing a new foundation and lifting and moving the structure onto this new foundation. This presentation today by SOSV board members will discuss the planning and logistics of working at this remote site on the southern shore of Lake Superior. 
and the photo there is a is a aerial picture of the uh, life saving station and the surrounding geography. Next slide. Are, are you able to advance to the next slide, Shohan? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, maybe there's okay. a delay due to the internet. Okay, all righty. And today's presentation will be broken down into uh, four parts. Uh, first of all, we will have a brief history of the U.S. Life Saving Service and the Vermilion Point Life Saving Station. And that will be followed by some background information on the organization of SOSV including our stabilization efforts, fundraising, and phased restoration work. And the third part will be the phase one restoration work that was accomplished in 2023. And then as time permits, we will have a short question and answer period. And Shohan already um, introduce the three speakers. Uh, we are all uh, board members. And as she mentioned, Bruce Lynn is the secretary of the SOSV organization and Rick Newman is the vice president and I am a board member. And with that, we will turn it over to Bruce Lynn. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ken, very much. Thanks for the introduction and thank you, Shohan, as well. And uh, we really appreciate everybody joining us for this webinar today. Uh, we're not as much as uh, the Vermilion Life Saving Station and that location is very um, foremost, I think, for a lot of us that are up in the Eastern UP or at least have visited that station in that area throughout the years. We're not always sure how many people in the state of Michigan are familiar with uh, Vermilion, uh, for that matter. I'd have a feeling a lot of people aren't. Uh, and we're also not always sure uh, the familiarity that people have with the United States Life Saving Service. And like Ken and Shohan said, I'm the director of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. And we, while we never had a life saving station at Whitefish Point, we did have a Coast Guard lifeboat station, which came later. Uh, in some ways, it's a very, it was a similar purpose, different era, very similar equipment. But I, I don't like to make assumptions about what people know about the life saving service. Either, And we find that a lot of people that visit us at Whitefish Point are, are very, very unaware. They know about the Coast Guard, of course, uh, but they, they, in many cases, at a very high percentage of people, have never actually heard of the Life Saving Service. So we'll do a little bit of backdrop history as to why there was a station built at such a remote spot, um, like Vermilion in this case, which is about 12 miles uh, west of Whitefish Point. And we, we start here in 1876, at least in this slide. I'm going to go back a little bit further because the, the beginnings of the Life Saving Service started is, is going as far back as the late 1780s in the United States. And these were uh, more, I guess, non-government, local efforts. Um, and if we look at the late 1780s, one of the first would have been the Humane Society of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts actually had a number of what you could call stations that were primarily for the purpose of uh, shipwreck victims and perhaps finding cover, uh, areas that they could get in out of the weather, uh, things like that. And maybe some very, uh, I guess, I wouldn't say primitive, but very basic stations where you might have volunteer crews with a purpose of getting a boat out into the water and trying to get people off of ships that were breaking up or sinking uh, that were pretty close to the shore areas, close to the shoreline. That was great because it was better than nothing. But as time moved forward, we get into the, going from the 1780s, we get into the 1840s and we started to see the first of what you could really call government efforts uh, at uh, life-saving uh, on the East Coast primarily. And one thing that I have to step back to too, and even going back further than the 1780s, much of what you saw happening on the East Coast or parts of it anyways were uh, replicated based on what the British were doing with the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. And them uh, and their uh, system that they had of lifeboat stations, which even if you visit Britain today, 
uh, you will see volunteer lifeboat stations, part of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution still underway, where we'll have Coast Guard and we'll have paid crews, uh, professionals doing this work. You'll still see those volunteer crews, highly trained, um, all the same. But if we look at the 1840s, we'll see the first investment on the part of the federal government, $10,000 for surf boats and rockets and other kinds of apparatus and equipment for life-saving and new stations uh, being funded and, uh, and built, many of which were still volunteer stations. And if we want an analogy for this, uh, think in terms of a, a, a volunteer fire department, <laughs> like we have up in Paradise, Michigan, you know, that's great. Uh, and it works well, but sometimes the the gentleman or the keeper, as he would have been called in charge of a station, sometimes had to go track down his volunteer crew. That doesn't do much for the crew on the ship if it's breaking up and every every minute or even second counts when you have someone trying to track down his crew. So volunteer stations could be good, um, and they were certainly better than nothing, but better things were to come, certainly. By the time we get into the 1850s, uh, by 1854 in particular, we started to see the first appropriations on the Great Lakes for different uh, lifeboat and life-saving stations. There were some fine differentiations. Lifeboat stations often, not always, but often were in built-up areas in big cities uh, where you might still use a volunteer crew, but that crew would be relatively close and they'd be using a much heavier kind of boat than we would have seen up at places like Vermilion. These lifeboats were very heavy, but you had a crew pulling on oars still to get out to a uh, ship that might be in distress or possibly driven ashore. So again, 1854, we see $12,500 uh, for lifeboats uh, stations on Erie, Huron, Michigan, and Lake Superior. So we started to see this development going on at this point. We're gonna skip ahead now, and I'm gonna take a sidebar from the government efforts to build these stations and supply equipment and areas with life-saving uh, devices, apparatus, and equipment. And let's speak briefly to the reasons for these life-saving stations, period. If you think of any of these stations, the whole purpose of a life-saving station and crew that manned it would be to keep an eye on the water, keep an eye, be it on a beach patrol where you might have a crewman just out there, you know, or you would have them out there walking the beaches and keeping an eye on, in our case, Lake Superior, in Vermilion's case, and watching for any ships that might be in distress. That was the whole point behind these life-saving stations, to render aid, assistance, and, and that could be them actively launching something like a surf boat or a lifeboat. We'll talk a little bit about those briefly, too, the differences between the types of boats. But also, just you had some situations where a crew might not even know about a shipwreck, but you might have some of the crew getting ashore in a lifeboat uh, or a raft or pieces of wreckage, what have you. And the difference with a life-saving station being in place was they actually had some place to go. They wouldn't die from exposure, which occurred in 1872. There was what came to be known as the Great Storm of 1872 on Eastern Lake Superior, where you had four shipwrecks with no survivors from any of these wrecks. And two of the wrecks are just west of Whitefish Point. They're between Whitefish Point and Vermilion. There are vessels called the Jupiter and Saturn. There was another vessel called the Mars that didn't depart for one reason or another from Marquette. And there was a steamship called the John Dix that were towing or was towing the Jupiter and Saturn. Well, like so, so often happened with these shipwrecks, uh, you had a steamship pulling schooner barges, basically, uh, you know, essentially schooners that were uh, turned into a different type of vessel with their masts cut down. But the bottom line was they were being towed. And very often, in the, at least in the area of Whitefish Point, these ships would get into trouble, these vessels, when the tow line would snap. Suddenly, the crew, crews on the schooner barges were left to their own devices, and more often than not, they'd be driven ashore. Um, they did have masts, they had sails, but uh, often those masts were cut down, so they, they really couldn't do as much as if they were, a, you know, a, an actual operating schooner. But the bottom line in 1872, you had these four shipwrecks, the two, the Jupiter and the Saturn, getting into trouble. Uh, and by 1876, and maybe uh, with the help um, of certain business people that had influence in Washington, D.C., we started seeing appropriations for Eastern Lake Superior, and that's where this station comes in. Uh, the fiscal year 1876 saw funding for four stations, and that would be Vermilion Point, which is 12 miles west of Whitefish Point, 
seven miles west of Vermilion, you had Crisps Point, and originally it was called Crisps. Of course, there's the lighthouse there that people are so familiar with these days, but the life-saving station was actually there first. And then to the west of Crisps Point, you had Two-Hearted River, and then west of that is Deer Park. Those are the four original stations, and each was built with the original Lake Superior type life-saving station uh, station house, which is the structure that we are looking to preserve uh, there at Vermilion. So 1876 saw that construction. By 1877, it was operational. Then 1878, you can see in this slide, we had uh, congressional legislation to create the life-saving service, an independent agency of the Treasury Department. I know for our interpretive staff at Whitefish Point, sometimes the beginnings of the life-saving service can be a little bit confusing because you did have uh, Congress authorizing, uh, authorizing funds for life-saving equipment, and you even have annual reports that have the name life-saving service on them prior to 1878, but I think arguably you could say this was the uh, formal beginning of the life-saving service. So we even had a station two years before that uh, and stations being built all over the Great Lakes, and in our case at Vermilion, uh, Crisps Point, uh, Two-Hearted River, and Deer Park. So pre-1907, um, there were uh, alterations taking place to this building that we are in the process of preserving. One thing I should remind everybody as well, there are the other stations of the original four, the Vermilion Station House, uh, again, the building that we're preserving and looking to uh, uh, continue working on, that's the last one in, in existence at this point. There really are no others of this type that are left, which I think adds to the importance of saving this building and preserving it. Uh, by 1915, you know, we're, we're into World War I era at this point, and we see changes taking place. And the Life Saving Service uh, now uh, merges with the Revenue Cutter Service, and we have what has come to be known as the Coast Guard today. And that's what most people recognize. I think most people would imagine if they got into trouble, maybe in their own private boat, and there was a Coast Guard station nearby, that's where help is going to come from. And uh, much like it did for mariners uh, during the life-saving service era. Uh, by 1938, we have original structures now. We're leading up to World War II at this point. And if for those of us uh, that are uh, joining us here at the webinar, if you've been up to Vermilion, many of you will see these other structures. Clearly, they're newer. They look similar to other stations, other uh, Coast Guard stations of that era. As a matter of fact, if you go to Grand Marais, uh, you'll see similar architecture. Um, so not unique, uh, but those were built. And by 1944, uh, the Coast Guard closed the station down. Pretty sad. If you look at some of the original photographs of when those buildings were constructed, they were beautiful, beautiful, beautiful buildings at that very remote location uh, there at Vermilion. But by 44, that was closed down. And by 1947, the buildings and land sold off to a private party. Uh, and then in the intervening years, and I think many of us that are uh, interested in Vermilion and in, in, indeed on the board of directors over the years, uh, I know I first visited Vermilion in the 1970s. And oddly enough, it kind of looked I won't say it looks like it does now because we've been able to do this work. Um, you know, we uh, have put the uh, the foundation, you know, underneath it, and it, it does have a different look now. It's not settled in areas like it was before. But when I was a kid, that building looked very old back then, and it looked like it needed a lot of help. And that was the 1970s we're talking about. So um, by 47, like I said, it was sold off to a private property, and then by 2007, Little Travers Conservancy. Uh, purchases the property. And 10 years later, here comes uh, this small group um, uh, of which Ken and Rick and I are a part of, and, and Grace and Steve Truman and other board members. All of us have this shared um, love of that that part, uh, that Vermilion Point and that structure and, and the desire to uh, preserve that building itself, being again that it's the last one. So, Shohan, let's let's shift gears and go on to the next slide here. Look at that fade. Very nice there. So we're we're going to uh, take a look now. This is this is a number of years, obviously, past that original construction. 
But you can see with the arrow pointing there, that is the building that we're talking about. So again, each one of those four original stations would have had a, a station house just like this one. When it was first built, not necessarily in the era that you see represented here in 1907, but when it was first built, this was all things to everybody that was stationed uh, at Vermilion. It was the home for the keeper and his family. Uh, of that second story, you see that window, that's where he and his family would have stayed. Their cooking facilities would have been inside the building. You would have had uh, bunks in the back part of that second story would have been for the crew. Part of the building was used as a boathouse as well. So really, this building was everything in 1877 in that first year of the station being uh, you know, used. If you look at this picture, 1907, again, you see some outbuildings there. You can see the building immediately to the left or east of the uh, station house. That's a boathouse at this point, and that would have been now where the crew would have stayed. And that, again, the back uh, room of that second story, the front room would have been a drill room, and then the boats would have been down below. It just kind of in, almost appears to be in front of that building. You can see a lookout tower. Very, very important because, again, we have to consider the era. This is the way they would have known a ship was in distress was to actually physically see or hear if they saw a ship. Uh, if they saw flares going off in the night out on a stormy night, if they would have heard a steam whistle, uh, you know, with an emergency signal, uh, or if you had your surfmen would have been out there on the beach doing their beach patrol, uh, going out distances in either direction from the station, uh, that would have helped them to be out in areas where maybe the crew at the station in the lookout tower would not have been able to uh, see a ship in distress. Shohan, let's let's get the next slide here. Perfect, thank you. So kind of like the military, they, they had a lot of equipment they used and they trained very, very regularly. They needed to know their work inside and out. And these are kind of cool pictures because you can see again, 1907, the man in charge is a gentleman by the name of Carpenter. Um, he arrived in 1900, big fella. Uh, I have a feeling none of the crew would have argued with him about much of anything. He was a lot bigger than most of them if you look at the pictures, but he looked to be a very stern man and he was all about his business. Um, you can see in the upper left picture, they're training with a beach apparatus. Uh, what they essentially had here was a system which had a small cannon called a Lyle gun that allowed them to fire a projectile with a line attached to it, which would go if they were lucky, and I say they, the crew on the vessel, as well as the uh, life-saving service crewmen, you know, again, imagine a ship has been driven ashore. This was going to be one of the tools that the uh, the life-saving service crew could have used to actually try to rescue them. They fired that line uh, with the projectile into the rigging of the ship. If they actually got into the rigging, the crew of the ship had to keep their wits about them, and they would, you know, get that line in, tied off to a mast, and to make a very complicated process easy to understand. It was almost like a zip line that they had with what was called a breeches buoy. This was like a life ring with canvas pants attached. And here you would be on a line suspended above the water. The wind could be blowing 50, 60 miles per hour. Uh, but guess what? Your ship is breaking up and you don't want to be on that ship when it goes, when it totally breaks up because you'd be in the water with all of that wreckage and chances are you wouldn't make it. This was one of the tools used by the life-saving service and they would train like this on Mondays and Thursdays. They also had surf boat drill on Tuesdays. Uh, they had maintenance on Saturdays. They had signal drill that would be uh, another day a week, uh, probably Tuesdays if I recall. And then they also had signals drills on Fridays. So they kept them pretty busy. This was lonely out there. Uh, the other lower right-hand picture, and I'm, I'm uh, going to speed up here, this right picture on the right, interesting. Um, I don't know if you can really tell, but if that arrow can point on what looks like not the boat in the distance, but between the carriage and the boat is what's called a life car. And this was like a little submarine almost, but it was the same principle as the breeches buoy, where you would pack people down inside of this thing. They were supposed to be airtight originally with three minutes air supply. I read one reference. You'd have to be pretty trusting to pile into this thing. They'd close the hatch up and you better hope that crew would get you into the shoreline pretty quickly. Either way, it was another life-saving tool used by the life-saving service. Not as much in these areas like Vermilion, not as many cases. Let's hit the next slide here. Okay, a couple other things here and, and we've got uh, two more this slide and the next one before I hand it off to Rick. Uh, but you can take a look at Keeper Carpenter. It's definitely the right picture. There he sits in his chair. Um, don't really see any smiles there in those pictures, but I think that's just 
how <laughs> people were with these uh, photographs being taken back in the day. But Keeper Carpenter, you can see again in the left-hand picture, that's that boathouse that I showed in 1907 that was just immediately to the east of the building that we're working on. But you can see him on the left. You can see the crew there with their summer weight uniforms on, and you can see more tools of their trade behind them. And you see the surf boat uh, behind them, and that's on the right in that left-hand picture. These were interesting boats. They were considered lightweight, about 1,100 pounds. They were uh, self-bailing. If a wave came in, uh, they had scuppers that would allow the water to escape. You typically, a crew of six, at least in this era, would be pulling on oars to get out to a shipwreck. But the interesting aspect of these, they were not self-writing. So if that ship got turned over, which was not unheard of, guess what? The crew had to turn this thing back over again. And they trained on those Tuesdays using this thing. And I don't know if any of you have gone swimming in Lake Superior. You can do so in August and it's not warm. But imagine if you're during the shipping season, it's May, and you have to be training in that water. Uh, this wasn't fun. I have a feeling a lot of these guys were, you know, trying to dry out in front of the fire inside the various buildings afterwards. But they had to be proficient with these boats, and that surf boat was much lighter weight than the lifeboats. Very maneuverable, and thousands of people were saved using these things. This was really the uh, chosen vessel, at least for stations like Vermilion, to go out and pull people off of wrecks that were in trouble. So the last slide, for me anyways, uh, Shohan, I think the one thing that I'll say briefly is for stations like Vermilion, they really became their own community uh, by virtue of the fact of being so remote. So these life-saving service crew members, they were also known as surfmen. They were called uh, storm warriors. They were lionized very much so in the press because literally these men were putting their lives on the line for total strangers um, to try to save people off of these wrecks. But look at the families, look at the dogs uh, there, the kids, the strollers, so on and so forth. Uh, this was a big deal to have everybody stand in front of that camera and capture this little snapshot in time uh, to uh, capture these people in this very, very remote location. So having their families with them, these life-saving service crew members were certainly not getting rich. Right around this era was probably, I know in 1870s, it was around $40 a month they'd be making. Not a lot, but if you consider a private in the Army about the same time, $13 a month. So maybe they were doing a little bit better. But either way, um, it's a very, very little, I think, understood by the public large part of our maritime history. And that's one aspect of what we're trying to save and preserve, as well as the structure itself. So with that, I'm a little over on my 15 minutes. I'm going to hand it over to Rick. Great. Thank you, Bruce. That is such interesting history. The life-saving service. I, I really never knew anything about that until I got involved in this project in this building. And so it's very interesting. Um, okay, so Joan, let's go on to the next slide. We've kind of covered all of this. Again, this is uh, some views, some aerial views at the property looking west. You can see the beach and the four buildings that we're talking about, the lowest the closest to the bottom and to the right is the 1876 station. Um, the other three buildings had been partially renovated in the in the 1970s by uh, owner Elliot Noyce, who acquired the, the property um, sometime during the period when it was privately owned. And he sold it eventually to the Little Travers Conservancy in 2007. Um, let's go on to the next uh, view. Here's the other buildings that are there on site. You can see that they're definitely in better condition than the one there in the top right slide, which is the shows the 1876 building there on the left. Um, the preserved lands were acquired by the Conservancy in 2007 uh, through a bargain sale from Evan Noyes, who owned it then, with grants from the J.A. Woolham Foundation and the North American Wetland Conservation Act program. Next slide, please. Um, during Noyes' tenure, he created the Wild Shore Foundation, a private property land trust, and established an educational partnership with Lake Superior State University, which used the location as a summer field school. And uh, you can see people here in the 1970s. I first went there in the late 18, <laughs> the late 1960s. <laughs> and in this, this aerial view here on the left, the water was actually lapping right in front of the three buildings that are farthest to the north or toward the top of the screen. 
And so this whole beach era, all the way out to where present day Lake Superior is, has, has all, that sand has all moved in there since the 1960s. That shows you how, how dynamic the shoreline along these Great Lakes are. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the Conservancy's purpose is to conserve significant examples of natural lands for their own sake and to facilitate use and appreciation by the public in its five county northern Michigan service area. The Conservancy's mandate does not include preservation of cultural resources, but because it has a conservation ethic, the Conservancy responsibly sought to take the appropriate steps in considering historic structures on the site. So, um, with the new, newer 1938 buildings considered stable, um, Richard Newman Architect was retained in April 2010 to undertake a study of the dilapidated 1876 station. That study was completed in September of 2010, and it identified the important significance of the station in meeting these four criteria. First, the station embodies the distinctive characteristics of the type, representing the state of, state of function and aesthetics just after the federal government decided in 1871 to provide maritime life-saving facilities along the nation's sea coasts and lake shores. Second, the station is one of only five of the earliest 1870s generation stations remaining in Michigan. Third, the Vermilion Station is the only remaining of four identical stations, as Bruce has discussed already. And fourth, um, as Bruce has also related, the station is historically significant for its association with the early period of commercial shipping on Lake Superior in providing a glimpse into the earliest days of the maritime life-saving presence along Lake Superior's infamous shipwrecked coast. Next slide, please. In understanding the station's importance, Tom Bailey, the Conservancy's then executive director, proactively sought preservation options. In 2012, the Conservancy issued a formal request for proposals to the preservation community, seeking a group to acquire and move the station off the site, but received no proposal. In, in 2014, two years later, an expression of interest from the Chris Point Light Historical Society and then President Rick Brockway was made the Historical Society who had successfully saved and restored the Chris Point Lighthouse, uh, decided that you know it might be good to have, because they had a station that was identical to this there, as Bruce mentioned. So they thought maybe they we could move the station uh, to their location. But after investigation was determined to be extremely difficult and expensive to move the station either by road, which if any of you have ever been to either of these locations, the road um, access is very difficult. Another option we looked at was to move it on the beach, but there are several streams and by that time Lake Superior was at a very high level, so there was not a lot of beach left. And the other option was to consider moving it by barge, by water, and uh, that seemed to be a very extensive, expensive undertaking. <clears throat> so nothing was pursued after that. But subsequently, a couple of years later, five individuals, as we've said, met with the Little Travers Conservancy to form a new nonprofit group, SOS Vermilion, uh, which took place in December of 2016. I guess let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and here you see folks that were involved in that effort. Uh, we met at the Little Travers Conservancy office in Harbor Springs and formally created the group legally in January of 2017 and created articles of incorporation, or created our nonprofit status and uh, received a Michigan license to solicit charitable donations. And knowing that, that a separate group would now be responsible for the dilapidated building, the Conservancy in 2018 transferred ownership of the building to our group and also uh, leased to our group a small plot of land that the station sits on. Next slide, please. So this was the condition of the building. Uh, these next two slides show it from all four angles. Go ahead and, and to the next slide. 
you can see how dilapidated it was and how big an undertaking we decided this would be. Um, in thinking about all of this and kind of from the beginning, um, SOS Vermillion decided the station's period of greatest significance was, it, was its original 1876 construction. Um, and as the only one of its type remaining on Lake Superior. But as is good preservation practice, any additions or alterations to the original that are to be removed should first be documented with measured drawings and photographs because the original station with it, the additions attached was documented and recorded by the Historic American Building Survey in 2005. Um, we decided that it was appropriate to remove the additions in order to just restore the original building to its era of greatest significance. So let's move ahead now and uh, view a number of other slides. So beginning uh, in, in the summer of 2017, we had summer work sessions to remove uh, existing buildings, existing additions. So some of these additions were quite early. So um, in some ways, it, it is unfortunate that they've been removed. But again, as I've said, and as our group feels strongly about, it's the importance of its original construction that we think we're trying to preserve. So um, go ahead and move to the next slide, please. These were our first two efforts um, to remove the small back addition and then this front small vestibule addition that you see the ladder leaned against. It's interesting in the upper right corner because this was an early addition. We uncovered the original wood shingles that were on the original station on that corner that you see once that small addition was removed. And since it was an early addition, we can be pretty well assured that these shingles are original to the 1876 construction. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, then the next summer, we took on removing the big uh, addition to the east, uh, which you see in these three images. It was a bigger undertaking for all of us amateurs up there on long ladders up in the air. Next slide, please. And uh, you can see what kind of condition that wing was in there on the left, upper left. But by the time we got done that season of 2018, uh, the lower right-hand image shows the condition that the building was in. We're, we're now back to the original 1876 station, although this gable end that you see here on the on the right um, is not original because the part we took off was an extension of that. So that's, that'll be a project in the future to rebuild that roof to match the other end. Next slide, please. Um, a lot of the work that we've done in the summer since then is just being able to try to keep the place boarded up and keep the uh, asphalt paper roofing it's on because there, there is no shingles underneath this. It's, it's just bare roof sheathing and rafters. And so the only weatherproofing we have are these batten strips holding down the asphalt building paper, which doesn't stand up to Lake Superior's fury uh, most of the time. Uh, next slide, please. These are uh, a, a later work session to clean out the interior. You can see the condition of the flooring was just rotted away and virtually gone. We started clearing out as much as we could because we knew that the at some point the building movers were going to need to get in here and have access to all of this. Next slide, please. And so that's what these crews were doing, was sal salvaging uh, anything we could find on the interior that was worth keeping. The front room was lath and plaster. Here you can see in the upper left picture, the back boat room was uh, is paneled in wood paneling. Next slide, please. Um, one of the losses that we had was one year, this in, as pictured in the lower right picture, uh, you can see the gable end treatment with the decorative treatment that's on the front of the building. This is the front of the building we're looking at. And at some point that winter, that whole gable end just dropped to the ground. Uh, so we salvaged as much as we could and it's stored away. Next slide, please. And so uh, Ken was able to uh, get a contractor that he had worked with before from Sault Ste. Marie out there and they did some patching of this gable end, which will kind of 
mothball it till we can get to restoring all that woodwork. And once that part of the, the roofing project gets underway. Next slide, please. Um, one of the other interesting things that we've accomplished in um, recently, summer of 2021, is we worked with uh, Dr. Lynn Evans, who is a member of our group and who is the uh, archaeologist in charge of all the state historic parks at Mackinac and has done archaeological work there for 40 years or more. She helped us with a volunteer dig of a privy site, an old privy site that was behind the station. And so these next two slides, go ahead and advance the next one. Our slides, I guess it's just that one slide. And then um, at, the, at the end of that time, this is the condition of the station in moving ahead for phase one restoration. So I'll turn this now over to Ken, thank you. All righty, thank you, Rick. I guess one there's one last slide there oh, yeah. also. Um, oh yeah, fundraising. I I I better cover that. I, I, there you go. <laughs> okay, critical to restoration is fundraising, and critical to fundraising is exposure. So, SOS Vermillion set up a website and a Facebook page, and by 2019, we garnered about 350 followers. The group also designed and placed interpretive signage on the site as well as a donations repositories to appeal to the stream of visitors that, that frequents this, this preserve. So ending in our first year, 2017, we'd raised about $3,400. By the end of 2019, uh, we had $5,000 on hand. We also we garnered a $3,100 grant from the U.S. Life Saving Service Heritage Association, which was our earliest big donation. So that was an important thing to get underway with. Um, by 2019, we ended that year with about $5,000 on hand, but it was, and by 2020, we had grown our funds to 9,300, but it was the year 2021 that really exceeded all our expectations as our funds that year initially jumped to about $25,000 with the receipt of three $1,000 gifts, a $1,500 gift, and a $5,000 and two $5,000 donations. So we were looking pretty good, but then that same year we received an anonymous donation of $50,000 and thus with the promise of a one-to-one -one matching donation of up to another $50,000 if we could raise the match. So. Fortunately, with uh, all our supporters and uh, donors, we were able to raise that additional $50,000 to secure the other 50,000 in match money. So we garnered an additional $150,000 in 2021. And that's what has now enabled us to go ahead with phase one restoration, which now I'll turn over to Bruce to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Rick. Um, well, as uh, as Rick has had mentioned, um, by 2022, our organization realized that we had sufficient funds to proceed with an initial phase of restoration work, which was going to be constructing a new foundation and lifting and raising the building, moving the building. Uh, so in the spring of 2023, SOSV was able to negotiate a construction contract with general contractor KP Newman and Sons out of Sheboygan, Michigan, uh, which covered uh, the new wood foundation and lifting and moving the 1876 building. And the construction contract was approximately $100,000. Next slide, please. And this is a quick photo of the uh, the construction team. Again, the general contractor was KP Newman and Sons out of Sheboygan. And in the upper left-hand photo, the fella in the yellow shirt was Perry Newman, and he was the lead carpenter on the project. And the subcontractor for the building move was JNR Building Movers out of Petoskey. And the upper right-hand photo is a 
photo of that crew. And then we had a local excavator out of Paradise, Michigan, Roaches Big Country Excavating. So that was the team that was responsible for our phase one restoration work. Next slide, please. So um, early in the summer in June and July of 2023, the construction team was able to construct the new foundation. And as you can see, this foundation was, was put literally about seven or eight feet away from the original building. It was due, uh, it was placed due east of the building. And I will explain a little bit about our thinking behind the placement of the building. Um, but again, you can see we've got a we had a nice site. The site was clear, and this is all primarily beach sand that we have um, on this whole uh, whole parcel of land here, and a lot of lot of wind blown sand, and not a lot of vegetation around the building itself. Next slide, please. This might be a little bit hard to read, but the the drawing on the right hand uh, side of the paper there shows the placement of the relocated building in relation to its original location. And originally the building was about 14 foot nine inches away from the 1938 Boathouse building. And we moved it approximately 39 feet to the east. And it's now about 53 feet away from the Boathouse. And we uh, did a lot of measurements and recording and we've got uh, this drawing here is really an as-built drawing so we've recorded the the precise location of where that 1876 building originally was next slide please and we were we debated as an organization we debated back and forth quite a bit about uh, factors for consideration to move to moving the building versus lifting it and placing it back down and the three primary reasons uh, the first one was cost it was less costly for the building mover to lift the building and slide it over onto the new foundation rather than lifting the building waiting for a new foundation to be constructed and then lowering the building back down so we were able to um, make that much more affordable for our budget uh, space by moving the building approximately 39 feet to the east additional space was gained between the 1876 building and the 1938 boathouse and as rick mentioned uh, we've also leased a approximately 100 by 100 foot parcel of land that surrounds the building and by moving this it more, uh, it centered the 1876 building a little bit better in that 100 by 100 foot parcel. And the third reason was the archaeological preservation. After the building was lifted and moved, the existing site was graded over, leaving the existing foundation and any buried material undisturbed. And this will allow for future archaeological work at the original site. Next slide. So in early, early August of 2023, the real work started here. And these are some photos of the contractors working on installing some new framing and reinforcing on the interior of the structure in preparation for the move. The photo in the lower right-hand corner, you can see some of the newer studs which were which were rough cut studs to match the configuration of er, the size the dimensions of the original studs but they were they were sort of sandwiched in the wall cavity there and temporarily uh tacked to the existing studs in in preparation for the for the move um as you can see we had to remove uh, some paneling and, and some of the interior finishes to get to, to get enough of the structure exposed. Next slide, please. And here on August 22nd, which was day number one of the of the two day move, uh, JNR Building Movers is in the process of uh, beginning to install some of the steel beams that penetrated the building from north to south and east to west. Uh, they were able to use some of the existing window and door openings, but they did have to cut a few more 
few more holes through the through the side of the structure to stitch together this steel framework um, that was going to be the the enabling structure for lifting this building. Um, in the two photos on the right there, you can also see some horizontal uh, two by 10 material, maybe two by 12 material that were bridging across all the studs. And that was also to become part of the structural framework for lifting the building. Next slide, please. And a few more, few more photos here of the continuation of the installation of the lifting beams and the, and the cribbing that was placed around the, around the perimeter of the structure here. Next slide, please. And here's where the, where the structure, and this is still all on the first day of the move, where the, the structural structure actually started to get lifted up from its uh, resting place of the last 150 years. And the, the two slides on the, on the right really show once this building was picked up a little bit, how there was literally nothing left of the lower two feet of the structure of this building. I mean, it was just all 100% gone. The floor was gone, the, the walls were gone and, and everything. And you can, you can see a little bit of the detail, these, uh, the supporting cribs there in the, in the lower right-hand photo there. Uh, that's where the lifting jacks were placed and, and you can see some of the roller, uh, the rollers that were used once the building was slid over to the east. I believe there were only, only four or five hydraulic jacks that lifted this entire structure. Next slide, please. And here's a picture of the building once it has been, the picture on the upper upper left, uh, once the building has been picked up and it is now positioned over the new foundation, you can see what very little material there is under the, the original foundation. I mean, wood debris and a lot of rot basically is all that was there. So that entire, that entire debris field has basically just been covered over and preserved, as I previously mentioned, for future archaeological investigation. Um, the two slides on the right show the, uh, the the new studs, the wall studs that were, once the building was positioned, they were kind of lowered down and mated to the to the foundation and the sill plate of the wall. And the bottom bottom right slide, you can see again the um, the amount of material from the sheathing that was really just gone. Next slide, please. And I think these photos here do a real good job of demonstrating how far in the ground this structure was buried. Um, you can just see that how much of the you know the lower two feet of this structure was just gone. I mean, it was just swallowed up by the by the surrounding soil. And um, uh, the, the picture on the upper right there, again, show from the interior, we still have a couple of the, uh, uh, the beams, the steel beams that were used to raise the structure. They hadn't been removed yet, but the, the amount of the wall sheathing that was gone and the wall studs and so on. Um, on the lower lower right there, again, you can see some of the some of the openings, the other openings in addition to the windows and doors that had to be cut um, for the for the structure to be moved. Next slide, please. And after the building was moved over the over the course of the next uh, next few weeks, the the contractors installed some new sheathing around the uh, the lower portion of the building uh, to replace the sheathing that was no longer there. Uh, covered, put some temporary felt paper around the sheathing to cover things up and provide some weather protection and ultimately sealed up all the all the openings and the and the holes. Uh, next slide, please. And these are these are a couple of views as how basically how the building stands as of today um it, again pretty rough still a lot of lot of uh, a lot of material to be dealt with on the interior 
Uh, the picture on the upper right shows the from the interior, uh, looking at the the diagonal rough sawn sheathing that was used to uh, fill up the uh, the voids that were at the lower portion of the wall. And I, I would like to mention that a lot of the we tried to salvage and save as much material from both the interior and the exterior of this building as we possibly could, and it is stored on site in some of the other some of the other buildings there. So we do have some material available to us for further restoration efforts. Next slide. And this is this is basically how the building stands today. Um, we, you know, by November, we buttoned it up for the winter and basically it, it kind of sits empty. Uh, any adventurers that might go out there on snowmobiles uh, probably walk the site, but our, our, our group typically doesn't get out there over the winter months. So it's, uh, it's sitting like this right now, waiting for the next phase of restoration, which we've dubbed phase two restoration. And the phase two restoration is going to include repairs of the roof structure and installation of new wood fascia and soffits. And uh, as Rick has me had mentioned, if you look at the picture on the lower right, you see that gable, uh, which is facing east. Uh, that has to be reconstructed to match the, the hip roof configuration that you can see on the upper left-hand picture there. That's facing facing west. So those really those hip roof configurations will be identical on the east and west ends of the building. So that has to get reconstructed. And then we will be installing a new wood cedar roof, wood cedar shingle roof on the building. And again, that's pretty much how we have left the building as of November 2023. And we're excited for, for the upcoming phase two work. Next slide, please. And that basically kind of concludes our presentation here. The, the little rendering um, on this slide is a, is a depiction of what the building looks like. That is the, the north face and the, and the east face of the building and showing the, the red roof, the red wood shingle roof that was originally on the structure that we intend to replicate. And uh, we will see how our efforts go down the road here. And that's basically the end. And look at that, it's 159. On behalf of SOS Vermilion, we would like to thank you for attending this webinar and for your interest in Vermilion. And I've got uh, some contact information there for our website and our Facebook page and our contact information and email contact information. So once again, thank you to everybody and thank you to MHPN for giving us the opportunity to pro provide this short webinar. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Shohan. Hey, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bruce um, and Ken and um, Rick for your presentation. And we do have a lot of questions. Um, if you're okay to stick around for a little bit, we will get yep. them answered. Absolutely. So first question, um, Ken and Rick, um, you live quite a distance from the station's location. So how did you get involved with this project? Well, on my part, it was because, uh, well, I had been there previously and seen the old buildings, but I was retained by the Little Travers Conservancy to do the study to try to determine whether the 1876 building was significant or not, because typically when the Conservancy acquires parcels to be part of their preserves, they eliminate buildings that are on their properties because, you know, usually they've never acquired properties that have historic buildings on them, so they didn't have a lot of background in that. But the, like I said in the presentation, because of the preservation ethic that the Conservancy has relative to natural resources, they understood that that carries over to cultural resources. And so they hired me to do this study. And that's when we determined that this station building was significant. And so the Conservancy wanted to do the right thing and try to make sure that it didn't just 
Boulder away. And, and so our group formed and. Mm -hmm. and, and. And for me, the answer is kind of simple. Although I live in Marquette, I do have a cabin over in the Paradise area. So I, I have a, a cabin that's probably only about six or seven miles away from Vermilion. And I've been wandering around that site for many years. Hey, thank you. Um, next question. Did those at the stations have any forewarning when the vessels were coming their way, like um, used by Morse code, Morse code? You know, I could probably feel that one. I think it depends on the era that we're talking about. But when we look back at the era when that station was constructed and then the other three were constructed as well, they wouldn't have had that technology at that time. So that's why it was so important that they would have uh, life-saving service crewmen out doing their beach patrols and up in the lookout tower. And, you know, imagine all those hours up in the tower with your binoculars or your telescope and looking out over the horizon. So it was a pretty basic way of discovering shipwrecks. But again, there were many, many instances where uh, ships went down and survivors from these shipwrecks, unbeknownst to the life-saving service crews, um, would wash up in the areas of those life-saving stations, and that kind of spoke to their importance as well. But, you know, once we got into the Coast Guard era, and of course it was just after World War II when they closed up those buildings, it kind of became a reserve station, if you want to put it that way, to Whitefish Point. Uh, then we were seeing technology changing. But during the life-saving service era, not so much. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, this is a huge volunteer effort. So um, I see a lot of pictures that a lot of work were being done by volunteers. So like at which point did you bring up, bring in the contractors at the foundation when it's being poured or? Actually, the, the first, um, really the first uh, contractor that we hired was um, in 2020 to make that initial roof repair um, there was one slide that that showed the where the station um, experienced some significant damage to the roof and that was beyond the capabilities of uh, of our volunteer group um, and then after that it wasn't until the until the construction of the of the new foundation and the moving of the building but um, I guess, in my opinion, there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, we're a pretty uh, pretty energetic group of volunteers, um, our board members and some of our other members and, and other volunteers that helped us over the years. And number two, we didn't have any money for a lot of years, so we couldn't afford to hire anybody. So we had to go out there on our own and, um, and do the work ourselves. Well put, Ken. <laughs> Okay, next question. How secure is a property if people are visiting? Is there a possibility of um, malicious damage? Is that ever a problem? Uh, I think the Conservancy has had a pretty good track record. I mean, these four buildings have been there for a long time. I can't speak to what they've encountered, but in terms of our building, I don't think we've felt like anybody has ever broken in. Of course, there's not much damage you could do to such a significantly extensively damaged building already. As things progress, we'll find out more as we, you know, restore windows and doors and have glass there again someday. Uh, hopefully we won't have that problem. But no, mm -hmm. I don't think there's been any significant I think if there was, it was earlier eras. So if we if you look at after the Coast Guard closed the station down and then eventually sold off to uh, private ownership, you know, in some of those intervening decades, clearly there was some vandalism that was done to the building and people were breaking in and getting, uh, mm -hmm. we, we've even had artifacts and ledgers and documents uh, donated to us at the museum, Shipwreck Museum, um, that people in one way or another came across these various life-saving service artifacts and, and donated them to us. But I have the feeling some of those that were from Vermilion and, and really the building was even open for a while because we had a lady who approached us and uh, shortly after the Korean War, she and her husband were 
honeymooning up in the paradise area of all things, which that was pretty remote back then. But uh, they uh, met a gentleman who had a Jeep and he drove them out there and the building was pretty much wide open at that point. And people were able to get in and, and in her words, there were documents all over the floor. Uh, there was, you know, so I think in those eras, but I think uh, as Rick pointed out, uh, not really that much now. Mm -hmm. And and we would like to mention also that the that the site is wide open to the public. You know, the public is free to visit that site at any any time. Um, all of the buildings are locked up and secure, and um, uh, there are some uh, some biologists that do occupy uh, live in the buildings for part of the part of the summertime period. So you do have some biologists living there that are involved with studying some of the birds that that nest in the area so you do have you do have some some presence of of other people at the site that i think kind of deters any vandalism hey thank you um next question um are the places of interest along the lake superior shoreline connected in any way is there a self-guided tour around there's, I guess, Shohan, it would depend on which uh, attractions or which historic sites uh, the member was asking about. But, uh, you know, there's really not. There are different, like, kayaking trails, if you want to use that word, uh, that has some information. Um, and that was one reason we had put up the interpretive uh, panels that are there at Vermilion 2 to give people a better idea what they were looking at. Um, you know, at the Shipwreck Museum, we do interpret the history of those four life-saving stations. So we we speak to that history to a degree. Um, but I don't know, Ken and Rick, are you familiar with anything? I'm I'm really not that connects all the the different sites. No, I am I am not familiar with anything either, Bruce. I don't know, Luce County. I mean, there might be some kind of uh, travel type brochures that you know are passed out by a chamber of commerce or something like that but beyond that i'm not aware of anything um next question is climate change affecting the lake level and may be threatening to the property in the future well to date um most of the the, the dynamic shoreline is sand and Bruce can probably speak to this about how, how dynamic the beach lines are. But, you know, if you look at old maps of, of Chris Point, it was a huge big point that was there at one time when, when the life-saving station like Vermilion existed there. But now all of that land is gone during the, the periods of high water on Lake Superior and storms. That land has all been swept further to the east and that's what the sand is that's at the beach now in front of these buildings, because as I say, in the late 1960s, the water level was right to the edge of these four buildings. And now there's maybe an eighth of a mile or much <laughs> almost of sand beach in front. And Bruce, maybe you can speak to what just happened at Whitefish Point during one of the storms recently. I can. Yes, I can. And there's historical context for this, too. And, and Rick brings up a good point uh, before I get to Whitefish Point. Um, you know, the lake levels have been, I don't know if I would say historic highs and maybe Rick and Ken can tell us if, that, if that's what they are, but it's, it, there's almost no rhyme or reason to what's gonna happen to that shoreline. You could have lake levels extraordinarily high, uh, but yet one year from the next, you may gain a lot of beach. And if you look at the amount of distance, and as Rick pointed out, about an eighth of a mile from the Vermilion Station building to the shoreline, think about the Life Saving Service crew. If they were still working that building, they'd have a long way to take that boat to get out to the water to try to rescue a crew off of a ship. Uh, so it's hard to predict what's going to happen to that shoreline from one year to the next. Uh, what Rick was referring to at Whitefish Point so we did have a storm come in uh, probably about six weeks ago uh, that literally made a whole section of Whitefish Point just disappear. Uh, it, it's underwater at this point. And you you really have to, and even for me, and I've, I've been up there most of my life and working at the museum the last 13 years, there's a boardwalk 
uh, that's on Fish and Wildlife Service Sini National Wildlife Refuge property that goes out to what used to be um, a uh, a bird. Uh, it would part of the Michigan Audubon has a uh, a bird counting shack out there. Well, that shack is gone now, and that whole section of the point is gone. It's all underwater. So you really have to try to get your mind around what you used to see versus what you see now. And it's almost as if that's how it always used to be. And I don't know, Ken or Rick or Ken, and some of your trips to your cabin, if you've seen that change now, it's it, it kind of boggles your mind a little bit. But we have references from lighthouse keepers going back before the turn of the last century, making the same kind of reference to uh, going out to the point one day or going up in the tower and noticing that half of Whitefish Point isn't there anymore. Uh, so that's it's not unheard of, um, but it is strange when you when you look at it. it. It is very very unpredictable whether the lake levels are going up or down. What's going to happen to your shoreline? And and, uh, and I think I'll... the particular storms that uh, hit in particular places are are what creates that dynamic character to the lakeshore. And I, I think we are at at Vermilion, and as far as the buildings at Vermilion go, we're very fortunate right now that the lakeshore is six or seven hundred feet away. Uh, you know, it, we're not threatened at all by the by rising water levels at at this particular site. So, I think if we were, we would probably be taking a different approach to restoration. Thank you. Um, next question. Were you able to tap any pandemic relief funds for this project? No, uh, I don't. I, I don't know. I didn't didn't think about that as to whether mm -hmm. there was anything geared to something like a nonprofit organization. But no, not as far as I know. You know, we had some at the museum, shipwreck museum, but that revolved around more of our staffing, um, and and you know things along those lines. And since we were pretty much all volunteer, those wouldn't really have. Uh, affected us, but I'm I'm not uh, aware of any of those or any of those. We, yeah, nothing that we would have applied for. Right, and and an another point is that SOS Vermilion has got no paid staff. We are all 100% volunteers. So, exactly. Okay, next question from Jim Scott, and he said, "What did the original foundation consist of?" Well, it was was wood posts, cedar probably cedar posts. Uh, I'm I'm sure there'll be some evidence of that that turns up at the time that any archaeological work was done there. But typically, that's what these buildings were built on cedar posts. Next question from um, Tammy um, Devote. And um, so the question is, is the presentation going to be shared? Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you um, afterwards. You will receive an email when the recording is available. Another question is that um, Tammy said, um, she published a magazine about structural, remove, uh, structural moving and would one of you be interested in helping her turn this presentation into an article of their for their organ, uh, magazine absolutely sure yeah rick rick and i rick and i volunteer for that right Rick? <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah and um the contact information is on this slide so um, please make sure to write that down and um, reach out mm -hmm. okay next question um so now that this project is proving to be a success, have you talked with your state legislators about a line time appropriate to help appropriation to help finish? We have Gosh, not. I don't know. In my experience, I've been around historic preservation for quite a few years, as has as, 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 uh, both Ken and Bruce. And I don't know of any state funding that's available for things like this. I mean, the State Historic Preservation Office does have some grant money that they 
um, provide each year, but it's typically more for study work rather than for bricks and mortar work. And uh, the only real financial effort that I'm aware of is the state um, rehab tax credit. But since we're a nonprofit organization, that really doesn't benefit a, a not-for-profit. So I, I'm not aware of any state funds that would potentially be available, but I would certainly be open to any any discussion about that if anybody knows of anything. You know, I would agree. I think the only thing I would add to that is early on, we, I think if I remember correctly, we had some discussions uh, with SHPO to see if the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program might somehow translate to this. Um, Ken, Rick, do you remember talking about that? I Obviously, the answer was no somewhere along the lines if we did, but I thought we did talk about that at one point. We yeah. we did. We did yeah. talk to them, Bruce. Yep, you're correct. But and you're correct. The answer was no, that it, those funds did not apply to a life saving station. Mm -hmm. There you go. OK, next question. Uh, when is a grant opening? <laughs> yep. that's a good question oh, the, a tour is available every summer during a work session yeah. <laughs> right right get, get, your gloves, get your gloves and your water bottle and uh, we'll put you to work and give you the tour I, it, Rick I think hits the nail on the head I think take a look at our website um, SOS for million uh, are we dot com or dot org right in front dot of org you. Yep. Yeah, take take a look at that. And I know certainly if you become a member, uh, and this is our commercial here, but if you become a member, you're going to be getting those updates uh, from our president, uh, Grace Truman, and, and she certainly uh, adds information about uh, various upcoming you know needs as far as volunteers to help with work sessions. Um, I think the grand opening, that's going to be pretty hard to predict at this point, many, mm -hmm. many years from now. Uh, but certainly, if you want to kind of get the insider view of the place and, and the insider information about what's happening, becoming a member is going to be your best bet. Well, and I think an interesting thing maybe to uh, speak to also is our vision is that we would like to restore the exterior of the building to be, you know, a, a restored historic presence in the group of historic buildings that are there on the site. What will happen to the inside of the building? We have no idea. Would we ever try to restore the interior or not? Our, our group has made no decision about that. Our, our focus right now is to restore the exterior and return it to its original appearance. Hey, thank you. Um, next question. With the extensive rod to the exterior wall framing, where all the exterior wall studs sister to extend them to original height or was preservative uh, treated studs used? Um, in answer to the first question, I would say, boy, Rick, I would say probably 95% of the studs around the exterior perimeter of the building were, um, you know, new, new studs. Um, were installed and sistered to the original studs and extended down to the new steel plate. I go as far uh, as to say 100%. Yeah, maybe it was 100%. <laughs> You're probably right. Um, and, and they were it was not treated material. I mean, this was uh, this was untreated uh, rough sawn lumber that that was used for that. And we carefully established the. Um, the existing first floor. There is a second floor in a building. Uh, to, in a building, the, the the appropriate height, and we made sure that we were as close as we could get to that to maintaining that original floor to floor height with the with with the new um, the, the new studs that were installed. One thing we've tried to do where where any interior framing would be exposed, like the new floor sheathing. The new studs and the new wall sheathing are all all cut lumber as rough sawn, like the original, so that if there's never any interior restoration done, the appearance of all the wood will be appropriate to its original era as rough sawn lumber. Thank you. Um, okay, one of our 
uh, uh, attendee is going to make a small gift simply to say thank you for a great presentation. Yay, thank, thank you. Thank you very, you very much. That's great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> hey, um, next question. We can tell you that it'll buy some shingles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, why did you choose a wooden foundation instead of a block foundation? Rick, do you want to do you want do you want to talk about you know we spent a quite a bit of time evaluating different foundation systems and go ahead Rick I'll let you run with the ball. Yeah, we did we did one system was of course uh, cedar posts as was there originally. We talked about um, block about precast concrete footings and piers. Uh, those would have been difficult and heavy to move in off site. There is a narrow bridge that has to be crossed by vehicles to get into this property. There's a gate. Um, the public uh, cannot just drive onto the preserve. The preserve land has a, a parking lot, and then you venture across the, the bridge. It is a vehicular bridge, but not a large bridge. Um, so we were also cognizant of weight and moving material back and forth. And the contractor that we began to work with they offered the idea that they would build, prefabricate the, uh, pre, the pressure treated lumber uh, foundation walls and piers in their shop in Sheboygan and be able to move those up because they're lighter at being wood frame material and concrete. And so uh, that seemed like the way to go. So we were able to just uh, use a excavator to clear a level site. And then uh, the construction crew set the footings in place and set the wall panels in place and then framed a new floor on top of that. So we did investigate various options. Helical screws were another possibility, but uh, in the end, treated wood seemed like the logical way to go, mm -hmm. both from ease and cost. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, do we know how many rescues were attempted from the station? And are there any records of those attempts and the results? That's a great question. Um, off the top of my head, and I don't know about Rick and Ken, I, there were a number of years right after the station had been built where there were no real um, shipwrecks or maritime accidents in the area. Uh, but to be able to give a statistic, I could get that information. Um, and if there's a way, Shohan, if that person, if they're willing, they could leave their email address and I could probably get that information for them. Okay, so um, when you receive an email from me uh, with the recording, please um, send me an email so we can get you connected. Okay, next question um, from Teddy Zerbel. Um, so Teddy said, I am interested in volunteering on phase two of the restoration. Um, so what is the process that, um, that needed to go through and um, what accommodations are in place for volunteers during the course of the project they need to be on site? Um, you know, I guess, uh, I think the, if you send an email to that, to that email address, the S O S period, O period, S period, vermilion at gmail.com. That goes directly to Grace and Steve Truman, the president and the treasurer of the organization. And um, they, they are really the ones that schedule volunteer work sessions in that. And, and as you, as you probably can tell, this is, um, as we've mentioned, you know, the site is pretty remote. Um, and it takes a little bit of an effort to get there, you know, out of the, from the, from the village of paradise, it's probably takes at least a half an hour. Uh, you've got about 20 minutes driving down some logging roads and, and that, and to get, to get out to the site. Um, there is no camping or anything at the site. Basically, 
as as we've had volunteers, people have found their own accommodations in local hotels in in the Paradise area, and um, that is basically how it how it has worked. Our all of our volunteer work sessions have pretty been pretty much been just day long efforts and sometimes spanning over a couple of days, but basically everybody drives out, meets there at the site early in the morning and, um, and, and heads home by, by sunset really and reconvenes the next day. So that's, that's pretty much how we have handled it in the past. And again, there is no, there is no camping permitted out at the, uh, out at the preserve. You know, Ken, if I could add to that though, if someone, uh, was inclined to go camping, um, that this person asking the question, there is uh, Andrus Lake State Park is only just a couple miles. It's actually on the road, Vermilion Road itself. So when you turn and you know you don't even go an eighth of a mile, uh, that state park camping area is right there. So if a person who's asking a question like that is inclined to want to camp, that's a pretty close, mm -hmm. probably the closest place you could actually be uh to stay if you had a tent or a little camper or what have you right <clears throat> and, and then you know there are motels in paradise that would be the next closest location exactly yeah okay so if you have any additional questions regarding volunteering um please email the organization directly um okay uh, next question um so was it was a structure report prepared or required? Were building permits required and inspections done for this project? Yes, um, through uh, Whitefish Township, we received a uh, we applied and received a for a zoning permit, and then the uh, Chippewa County Building Department was the. Uh, building official that oversaw the work that was done here. And yes, a building permit was issued for the foundation mm -hmm. work. Okay, I think we have answered all the questions and there are a lot of thank you um, in the Q&A box um, from the audience. And um, thank you, uh, I wanna say a big thank you to our speakers today for your time and knowledge and giving us an update on this project. And we look forward to hearing more about it, um, about the phase two at some, we look, at some point, yeah. We also look forward to phase two and telling everybody about phase two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and thank you everybody for attending our webinar. And uh, before we uh, get off, I would like to quickly announce our February webinar. Um, so February is the um, Black History Month, and um, we are going to celebrate the special month by having a topic. Um, so it's going to be the Underground R Railroad Society of Cass County, Michigan. And I hope to see everybody next time.